This is 29-year-old Dallas Seavey winning his third consecutive Iditarod championship. A new official record for Iditarod. He is our champion. First of all, I just want to say I'm not that intense. Don't worry about it. This is what I do for fun. I enjoy traveling across Alaska with sled dogs. First off, though, I got to say this has been an incredible group of very talented people and great speakers that we've gotten to listen to over the last couple hours here. But I want to warn you. I mean, the most creative thing I've ever done with a piece of wood is make a fire. I don't have a PhD. In fact, I didn't even graduate high school. In fact, I didn't even go to high school. I was homeschooled. So. Don't worry about that. We're not going to be getting technical. The most complicated paper folding I've ever done is I did once get a letter into the envelope. All the words were misspelled, though. So, <laughs> what I do know, though, is sled dogs, and I like to be creative in that. Kind of like a creative solution in the nature of pink that I had this morning. I traveled from Alaska. It's a very long ways away, and、uh, there's about a 10-hour time difference. So, I woke up very refreshed after three hours of sleep at 3:30 this morning. <sighs> And I have another problem. I'm very, like I said, passionate about what I do. So when I come up here and they give me a timer that, good golly, we only have 19 minutes left, it's hard for me to leave the stage after 19 minutes. So I have a solution: coffee, lots of it. Now I am very awake, and I can guarantee you, in 20 minutes, I will need to get off this stage and find a restroom. So with that, let's get started. <laughs> so. My family has had sled dogs in Alaska for over 50 years. My grandparents moved to Alaska specifically to run sled dogs. They moved from the relative warmth of Minnesota, another northerly American state. My grandfather promised my grandmother this would be for two years. They would go see Alaska. My grandpa would get to go mushing dogs, and they would retreat back to Minnesota. 50 plus years later, my grandmother is still waiting for those two years to pass. And in the meantime, my grandpa started something of a family legacy. He's helped start the Iditarod. The longest sled dog race in the world. It travels over a thousand miles across Alaska, and it has now become the world championships of long distance racing. In this event, we're going to travel over every possible terrain, and it seems like they purposefully seek out the most challenging terrain for us. It starts out with going up over the Alaska Range. We're cresting over the highest peaks out there, and can be incredibly challenging to climb up that mountain, and absolutely. Frightening, going down the other side, where you're going down the side of a mountain with 16 very enthusiastic sled dogs that are absolutely pleased that you cannot slow them down because they have gravity working with them. After we go bombing down this mountain, we're going to make it to the Yukon River. The Yukon River will either be the easiest steps of the entire race, with the wind at your back and a smooth trail in front of you, or these are going to be the most challenging steps of your entire life, with a very hard headwind and deep snow the entire time. After we get across the Yukon River, we go up to the Bering Sea. This is an absolutely terrifying section of trail. We have cold, we have snow, and we have wind. The Bering Sea will bring it all, and wind is my least favorite, and it comes in great doses up there. Once you cover the Bering Sea, you reach the city of Nome that marks the finish line and the end of the thousand-mile race. You start the race with 16 dogs, and as you progress along the trail, if any dog has a problem, you can leave it behind at one of the 20 checkpoints, which we also ship our food and supplies to. The veterinarians along the race will take care of that dog for a day or two, fly it back to your home, somewhere hopefully on the road system and easy to get to. But the team goes on with one less dog, and this is where I come in. This is where strategy comes in, and I have to structure a team to be able to travel across this thousand miles and get there safely as quickly as we possibly can. This is what my family has done for many, many years. Now, one day, not all that long ago, I suppose, I was born. Now, believe it or not, I was born at a very young age, so I don't remember. <laughs> all right, <laughs> I don't remember exactly what it looked like, but I imagined it looking a lot like this. I came climbing out of a doghouse, tripped over the mama dog, already had my Carhartts on, had my mud boots on, picked up a shovel, and started cleaning up after dogs. This is why my brothers and I were all homeschooled. My dad had four sons,、um, my poor mom, and we were a lot of very free labor. So, with a hundred dogs in our backyard, we spent our child, entire childhood with sled dogs. Because of this, sled dogs were much closer to me than I think a normal house pet. 
Because not only were they our constant companion and our pet, but they were our classmates, they were our co-workers, they were our best friends. And maybe now is a good time to clarify one other point. I've mentioned a few times that I was homeschooled. That's not entirely true. I was mostly just home. So <laughs> that probably will be obvious here. Now, when I turned 16, um, my dad finally accomplished his lifelong goal of winning the Iditarod. This was his 11th attempt. And every single year, my family and I, we put everything we did, could into his racing efforts, into trying to improve whatever caused our, our failure, if you will, from the year before. How are we going to get better and better? And in my mind, watching my dad, who was an idol to me, try and, and seemingly fail year after year after year, it began to make this task look impossible. It began to make it look like the people that won the Iditarod were somehow superhuman. So watching my dad finally win this race was uh, a very powerful moment for me in a realization that with persistence and creativity and keep applying yourself year after year after year and solving one problem at a time, you can ultimately achieve your goal. I think that's when I decided that I was going to make a, a career of racing the Iditarod. I think I always knew I would be around dogs. I'd grown up with dogs. I would learned to see the world from a dog's eye view. I mean, at the very beginning, when I was only that tall, my eyes were at the same level as sled dogs. I saw the world the way they did. And little did I know then, but that would become my greatest strength in racing. Now, this is what I imagined winning the Iditarod would be like, right? You're mushing down Front Street in Nome. There's thousands of people. There's the lights. Um, you mush under the famous burled arch, and you've accomplished an amazing thing. Just finishing the race is an amazing accomplishment. Moreover, your lead dogs are wreathed with the yellow roses. It's all the fanfare. It's wonderful. Unfortunately, the reality is something more like this. <laughs> so for my dad to have won that Iditarod, that was one day he spent as an Iditarod winner in the act of winning the race. There was 4,000 days of doing this leading up to it. This is kind of what you have to love. Now, in 2009, I decided that now was the time. I was going to start my own kennel, I was going to branch off, and ultimately start competing with my dad. And to try to help raise funds, I wasn't a particularly wealthy 21-year-old at the time, um, I kind of put myself out there. I made a, a big claim, and that was, not only am I going to win the Iditarod, I'm going to become the youngest person to do so. That gave me a full four years to go from not owning a single sled dog or a single sled or any piece of mushing paraphernalia to winning the world championships. A little bit of a lofty goal, but it did help raise money, and I found some great people that believed in me in that mission. So the first thing, if you want to be a dog musher, you're going to need some dogs. So with my very limited financing, I was able to collect a group of dogs, 16 of them to be precise, which incidentally is the number of dogs that you need to start the Iditarod. And this was a bit of an eclectic bunch, might be a good way to put it. The one thing that all of these dogs had in common is they had just been fired from the previous job. Hence, their availability on the market. <laughs> Every single dog was unique. They all had their own characteristics. They all had their own personality. Some of the dogs on my team, like little Miss Guinness here, was not even supposed to be a racing dog. She was for sale because she was way too small to race the Iditarod. But she had great genetics, at least that's what this person selling them said. So she was supposed to be kind of the, the matriarch of the kennel, but not an active racer. However, with only 16 dogs, it caused us to change one fundamental fact about mushing that has become the foundation of my style of racing. In every kennel that was competitive in the Iditarod at the time, the process of training a sled dog was really the process of selecting a sled dog. They might have a kennel of 100 dogs, some of them even more, and you only get to start with 16. So they set the training bar high. They trained and they selected, and they found the best 16 dogs. Genetically speaking, these were fantastic dogs. My dad's team, for example, they looked like the presidential guard. Every single one was the exact same height. They were within half a pound of each other. They were very uniform. It was a great-looking group of dogs. These guys were kindly nicknamed the Scrubs, because I had everything from 75-pound Cessna down to 40-pound Guinness. But the big difference was I didn't have to set up my training in a, while, in a way to select the dogs. The only question I had to answer was not who was going to go. I knew who was going to go. They were right there. <laughs> right? But it opened up a better question, the question we should have been asking years before. Not which ones are going to go, 
but how do I prepare these individuals to the best of their ability by March, which is when the race starts? That gave us a very specific task. Another incredibly valuable piece of information was that I knew every single dog in this team had failed at the traditional style of training. That's why they had been sold. So it gave me a blank slate to try doing everything differently. And I began relying on the one thing that I'd always known. And that was to see things from the dog's point of view, to understand the world from their point of view. I found the things that made them stronger. I magnified those things. Where do you succeed as an individual? How do I make that be the realm that we spend all your time in? Where do you fall short? Where are your weaknesses? As a coach, as a team member, it's my job to navigate them around those obstacles that will make them less. We have to find the things that will make them greater and make that where they spend all their time, avoid the things that are going to make them weaker. I don't have time to go into the details, but one of the biggest things was we went completely against the grain and the trend in mushing at the time. At the time, mushers were getting better and better dogs, better nutrition, and they were starting to learn a little more about training. And the trend was to do longer and longer runs, which was a way to maximize their higher quality dogs, because these dogs were able to do 80, 90 mile runs nonstop. And I apologize for the, not, the inability, inability, that dang homeschool, <laughs> to translate to kilometers here. So anyway, the trend at the time was to do these bigger and bigger runs, which is basically going toe to toe and just slugging it out. There wasn't tactic. These dogs had proved that they couldn't do those long runs. That's what drew out their weaknesses for a little 40 pound Guinness who her legs are not that long. That's a lot of little doggy steps. So we dialed it back. We figured out what can you do successfully? And we found 45 to 50 miles they could do successfully. How do we make this a viable strategy? Well, by doing shorter runs, we can then take shorter breaks. But to take shorter breaks, I have to be more efficient. Because me as the musher, I'm the only person that can do anything for the dogs, my equipment, or myself. I am allowed no outside assistance. There is no pit crew. So I became more efficient. I streamlined every process into caring for these dogs. Because I was only training 16, I knew every single one of them inside out. And when we pulled into a checkpoint, I established a routine for them and me. We went through the processes quickly. I knew exactly what each dog wanted to eat. Because we were doing shorter runs, when we reached the checkpoints, they were not tired. They ate their food. Calories are the key thing here. These dogs are burning 12 to 14,000 calories a day for a dog that only weighs about 22 to 24 kilos. There, look at that. We're going international. <laughs> so... Being able to consume that food is huge, and that was a problem with those longer runs. The dogs weren't getting enough meals, and also be, when the dogs did a longer run, they were fatigued when they reached the checkpoint. Resting was a higher priority, so the mushers would stay there longer. The first hour or two of that resting time, the dogs were not digesting food. This is poorly managed time. It's, you're not maximizing these moments. By go, doing the shorter runs, we were able to get the food in more quickly, more meals in a day. The next thing was knowing the individuals. I touched on this a little bit a second ago. Because there were fewer of them, I knew them personally. This was crazy right here. This is crazy right here. She was a unique beast. <laughs> um, every single checkpoint we came into, as soon as we reached the checkpoint, she would start limping around very pathetically. She would run perfectly, but as soon as there was straw there, we, she would start limping around. So I would dutifully give her her massage with all the essential oils and the liniments. I'd put the little jacket on her that has the pockets on it for the heat packs to go in, put that on, put the extra jacket on her. She'd curl up and sleep nicely and then take off and pull like a fool for the next 40 to 50 miles. She learned that if she limped a little bit, she was the one that got the extra 20 minutes worth of massage. <laughs> I knew what she was doing, but what she needed was for me to acknowledge that I knew. I know what you're going through, and I'm going to help you with that. And we developed so much trust with these guys that they would do absolutely anything along the way. They knew what to expect from me, and we really became part of the team. Not the leader of the team, but part of the team. Now, after I get the dogs bedded down and fed and all the massages done and another massage for crazy there, it's time for me to take a little nap. Generally, I'm going to flop down on the straw just like that. I'm going to sleep for probably 30 to 40 minutes. This was one of the things that was an advantage to being a little bit younger. I could be more athletic on the trail, ski pulling and running alongside the dogs, and then in the checkpoints, be more efficient and operate on less sleep. Now, to put this into perspective, for the past 20 years of the Iditarod, the average age of a champion was 42 years old. I was trying to win the race by the time I was 25. 17 years younger? Question mark? <laughs> than the average age of an Iditarod champion. 
that points out to us that it's really more about coaching. It's more about strategy than your physical ability. But my strength was that I had more physical ability. I had just gotten done uh, wrestling as a profession of sorts. I was on the junior world team and wrestled for the U.S. senior team as well. So just like the dogs, I was trying to take what strengths do I have and how do I help that or have that benefit my team. So after I pop up wide awake from my little nap, I'm ready to rock and roll. Not quite. <laughs> Here comes the coffee again. So when you wake up from these breaks, you are in a different world. You are in a cloud. Um, day seven, day eight, day nine. These races are oftentimes being won in about nine days when I started racing. If you could do the race in nine days, two hours, you were going to win more than not. Um, when you wake up, you're not sure where you are. You're moving, kind of. Your brain, you feel like it's functioning, but your body is very sluggish. It's a very unique feeling. But this is one of the things I love about this sport, is that it breaks you down to the point where all ego is shed away. You have no energy left to put up some facade of who you are or who you want to be viewed as. You are simply you. You are broken down to that point. And you have to rely on your team. You become part of that team. You have to have them. And this is where you recognize that I'm not the leader, you know, puff up your chest, okay, you guys follow me. No, I am playing the role of the leader. I am part of the team, and my job is to do what's right for this team each day, do the best thing I can for them, and let them do their job. So once I get wide awake, um, it's time to head out, put the booties on the dogs, that's the little shoes that they're wearing. You're going to gear them up, get them all suited up. This is where you freeze your fingers quite a lot because this takes a lot of dexterity, and that means bare hands at 40 below zero, which incidentally is the same, Celsius or Fahrenheit, so that was an easy conversion right there. <laughs> so, once I get these guys bootied up, we're back on the trail, we'd run another 40 to 50 miles at a much faster speed. And what I started realizing as we were training like this is the dogs began to put more and more on the line because they knew that I wasn't going to ask them to go 60, 70, 80, 90, 100 miles. They knew that they could pull and work confidently and put it all on the line knowing that the person on the back of the sled will never ask them to do something that they cannot do, but more importantly, something that they can't do excitedly and quickly and putting their full effort into it. There's no need for them to protect themselves because they know that that's what I'm there to do. It's my job to teach them that they're Superman. There's nothing in the world that they cannot do. And the number one secret to that is as the leader, as the person with a slightly more developed frontal cortex, is my job to never put them in a situation that they are not Superman. So this style actually started to work. My first race, six months after bringing this group of dogs together, was the 2009 Iditarod. The best guess for what this team could do from the commentators and, of course, the ex-champions that now talk about the race, you know, kind of the, the has-beens out of the professional talkers now. I hope to have that job someday. But um, they were saying that this team, a win for them would be 20th place. That's their highest mark. And it's kind of like a personal best in a marathon. And I thought that was a realistic goal. But more importantly, I wanted to test the style that we had developed. And there was a lot more to it than what I've been able to out outline here today. So we stuck to the style. We forgot the race, we stuck to the style. I ended up finishing in sixth place, only about, what was it, 25 minutes behind my dad and his presidential guard team that was, at that point, the most consistent top, team fi top 10 finishing team in the Iditarod. It was amazing. What I realized is that we were all of a sudden traveling the fastest speeds this race has ever seen at the end of the race. By maintaining that healthy team, instead of racing hard in the beginning and surviving to the finish line, we were building in the beginning and thriving to the finish line. And this began to be the new goal. The next year, 2010, same group of dogs, we were able to do the race two hours faster than my dad had ever done the race, including his winning time in 2004. We were making progress. We finished eighth place that year. The next year, I finished fourth. Actually broke the record on the Iditarod Trail, but so did three other people. So, you know, it happens. <laughs> so, what I began to see is that this actually works. It's about building the team. It's about accelerating. And if you do that, then good things will happen. Don't worry about the end result. What you need to focus on is the cause. Winning is the effect. 2012 rolled around. This was my final opportunity to truly become the youngest person to win the Iditarod. We set out on the trail, and things went really, really well. We focused on our strategy, we focused on our dogs, we tried to kind of ignore the rest of the race. But a very strange thing happened. I found myself 700, 750 miles into the race, 
and I was actually in the front of the race. This was a very strange situation. I had never been in the front of the race before, and it left me a little, little bit of a dilemma. I'd always thought that I'd be coming from behind, catching up with teams. I'd always made tons of, you know, gained quite a lot of time in the last 300 miles of the race. But what do I do now that I'm actually winning the race? So I pulled into the checkpoint of Galena, and um, I had passed the, what was now the second place musher when I came into that checkpoint, and I had done that last section of the trail 20 minutes faster than she had. And immediately I started thinking, all right, how to have passed winners? How have they done this at the end of the race? Okay, what you do is you've got to get a gap. You've got to build a lead. You've got to put your team ahead of the competition. And then, um, yeah, that's kind of like the final nail in the coffin. So instead of my four hours, I set my alarm clock. And after three hours, I went out there and um, had my, scooped up my parka and all my equipment that I'd brought inside to dry. And I'm walking down to the team. And this had become habit. And then as soon as I saw my dogs resting there, the question hit me, what is the best thing for this team? What is the best thing I can do for my team right now? And the, question, or the answer was simple. They need sleep. They, we went 20 minutes faster because they were putting it all on the line. They were pushing hard. So I stood out there and thought about it, and I said, you know what? Forget the race. We came out here to run the perfect race, which to me means maximizing your team. So I went back inside and slept for another hour, and I gave the dogs four hours plus that 20 minutes that they had gained. I took off on the next run right with the second place smusher. We outran her by 30 minutes. I gave that rest right back to the dogs. The next run, we outran them by 40 minutes. We learned to build speed, not a lead. You reinvest in your team. With a great team, you can accomplish anything. A couple hundred miles later, we crossed the finish line, ran down Front Street through a crowd of 1,000 people. I got to live through my childhood dream, watch it play out. And something had changed, though, because when I crossed the finish line, it wasn't, hoorah, I did it. That was not the emotion I felt. I felt two strong emotions. First was almost a sadness that this race was over. I view building a team kind of like creating an ice sculpture. It's artistic. You take the materials you have here, you put together this team, they run a race, but it's not art that's made to sit on your wall for a thousand years. It disappears. Next year, each individual dog is a new individual. They're a little bit older, they're a little bit different, they have different experiences. We start over. It's the joy of creating that team. But the strongest emotion I felt was gratitude and pride in this little dog right here. Recognize her? That's Guinness the 40-pound lead dog, or what had become a lead dog, that was never supposed to run the Iditarod. She was my main lead dog the entire race. She won the Yellow Roses, but more so, what really made me proud of her is she ultimately won the Golden Harness Award, the MVP award for the greatest dog in the race. This is the highest honor a sled dog can receive. What it taught me is we don't know who our teammates are until we ask the question. Don't tell them this is what you must do. Ask them what can you do. That's when you find out who they truly are. I've got to use the restroom. Thank you. Thank you, Dallas.